Welcome back. So um, next I'll explain in more detail how the IDE um, framework actually works and uh, what are what its benefits are. So looking back at the example that I just discussed, um, let's uh, look a little bit deeper into what is actually being summarized here by these partial summary functions, right? So essentially when you're looking at this summary edge here, what is it telling you? Well, it's telling you, you have a procedural summary that maps zero to itself, right? So the tautological fact to itself. And um, likewise, we have these summary edges here, um, in particular, uh, this one, and this one, and this one, and they all map values to themselves, right? So this is saying, if you give me a zero, um, well, it will remain zero, right? And if you give me a one, the value of V will remain one and so on. But then we also have these uh, summary edges that go to the respective return values R. And this is represented by these mappings here, right? So, and that's again, this extensional view of defining a function, in this case, a summary function, right? So you can see this as uh, mappings, but you can also see it as a single extensional definition um, of a function um, that is just, you know, defined through these individual mappings. And now, instead of having these extensional definitions where we really map one value onto another, um, and each individually, we want to have instead an intentional definition that quantifies over concrete uh, values, in particular over concrete numerical values, because these are the ones creating our headache here, right? So the numeric domain is the one that is infinite and that we would ideally like to abstract from. And so um, let's take a look at what this could look like, right? So um, first of all, this part of the summary, it doesn't hurt us. That can remain as it is, right? So um, that's not actually a number zero here, right? That's rather the tautological fact. So this is still mapped to itself. Uh, that's not important to us. Um, but now we rather want to have um, such an intentional representation here where we sort of quantify over this number, right? So we basically introduce a new free variable i, and we say for all i, we want to map vi onto itself. And similarly, for all i, we want to map vi also um, to i plus one associated with r, right? And that's exactly, uh, well, that's, well, let's say it's at least as expressive as what you have up here. In fact, this is actually more expressive, right? Because this uh, holds for all i, and here you still don't know anything about what would happen if uh, this value was not two, but three or four, for example, right? So this actually covers more cases, um, but it also covers all that we want to cover, right? So this is really a representation that is also sufficient for our purposes. So this is sort of what we want. And now the question is rather how to actually represent and encode this and how to make a framework out of that. And so essentially um, you can see that um, there are two things um, to these pairs. And this is something that's important um, and that I want you to understand because uh, that really determines how you want to um, construct your particular instance of the IDE framework. So typically in IDE, you will always have these kinds of pairs. So you will always have different components um, of your abstract domain. And in particular, you will have these components that I'm here drawing on the left-hand side. And these are what I would call context independent. Um, and here, these are actually these variable names such as V and R. Why are they context independent? Well, if you look at V and R, then V and R are really parameters or local variables with respect to that particular procedure, right? So that means no matter what the context is, no matter who is calling into this increment procedure, V is always going to be called V and R is always going to be called R, right? That never changes. Um, so this means that's a value that is context independent. And this is great because we also want our summaries ideally to be context independent, right? I want to have a summary that I can reuse across every single calling context. That would be ideal, right? So 
one summary that I can always reuse. And so a context independent uh, value doesn't hurt here. Um, that's actually perfect. Um, the problems arise with these context dependent values. So if you look at the right hand side component, um, then here we would have this i or i plus one. Um, then this is actually the numeric value that is being propagated here, right? And uh, this numeric value, of course, it is dependent on the context, right? So depending on what value I assign to v in the caller, a different numeric value will be propagated here. And that's exactly what's causing this problem uh, of a lack of summary reuse in IFDS, right? And note here that um, while the value i is context dependent, a summary function that maps i to i plus one, right? So like this value to this one, that is really not, right? So I can represent this function using exactly uh, this denotation here. And that denotation is exactly the same for every calling context, right? So the representation is independent of any calling context because i now is a free variable. But the concrete value of i, of course, that can depend on the context. So the trick is now to go away from encoding these values explicitly, these context dependent ones, because uh, they, you know, their encoding would mean that these summaries themselves would become context dependent and therefore would not be reusable. And now I want to instead represent them using such a summary, uh, such a function representation here, an intentional sum summary, you could say, um, that is a context um, independent uh, representation, okay? And we already know how to represent these context independent parts, right? So in IFDS, for instance, we would have an edge from V to R to represent that some value is flowing from V to R, for instance, some taint, right? And the idea is now to represent uh, this representation here of how the context dependent value changes uh, to represent this as an annotation to the particular edge that we have here, okay? So we are annotating this edge that we draw here with a function. And in particular, we would annotate here an edge from V to R that represents that some value is flowing from V to R with this function that tells us what kind of value is flowing there. So this is basically saying, as the value flows from V to R, I increment it by one. And it doesn't matter which value it is because that value I'm quantifying over I'm abstracting from using this free variable i. Let's take a look at this example again. So whereas in IFDS, we would have uh, this domain of pairs here and these separate summary functions. In IDE instead, we would have such a domain that is simply restricted now to the uh, context independent parts. So in this case, to the variable names, okay? And we would have these edges that in this case you can really read as taint edges okay they tell you how data is flowing from one variable to another so that's the context uh, independent information and then um, to annotate the context dependent information we simply add function annotations to these three red summaries that we have here and in this case it's very simple it's the identity function so the value does not change here it also does not change. Um, so this is basically saying, uh, this is representing these uh, mappings here, right? So V is always mapped to itself and the numeric value does not change. Therefore we have identity here. And this is saying, as I map V's value to R's value, I have to increment that value by one. That's denoted exactly by this Lambda function here, okay? And um, yeah, in a more general setting in IDE, this would look as follows. So um, one thing you have to, um, oh, it's, it's important to explain when you take a look at the paper that actually describes the IDE framework, you will see that they no longer use um, the zero uh, 
denotation to actually denote this uh, tautological fact. But in IDE, they instead uh, use uh, this particular letter here. Um, is that actually an alpha? Well, let's call it alpha. Um, and um, so when you have this letter here, basically it, it's still the same, right? So it's still a tautological fact. Only in the paper, um, they did not want to use zero anymore to denote that particular tautological fact, because in the paper, they also talk a lot about applications of this framework to constant propagation. And then you would have had two different zeros in the paper, right? So you would have had the number zero and the tautological fact zero, which is really awkward to distinguish uh, when, when reading the paper. So that's why they uh, use this other letter here. But essentially, this is still the same thing, right? So you would still have this artificial tautological fact that you can use to generate information out of thin air. And then um, in the IDE framework, you basically have two phases of computation. So in the first phase, um, you essentially have an IFDS instance, and this is exactly uh, doing what the IFDS algorithm would do. So it's uh, creating these uh, flow fun or it's computing these flow functions and then creating summary edges um, using uh, the context independent information, right? So it would basically, in this case, track how variables are being assigned to one another. And then in the second phase, um, we uh, have these annotations of the context dependent information, okay? Um, so basically that means whenever such an edge is actually being created, it's automatically annotated using um, such an so-called edge function, right? So we have a, we here have a flow function that tells us that um, for an input value V, we have V and R as output values that's determined by the flow function marked in uh, black here. But then each individual partial flow function, you could say each micro function here, that is annotated with an edge function. And these edge functions are here labeled in red, okay? And uh, then these edge functions, they are created immediately when the edges are created. So for instance, when I'm uh, creating this link here, this edge from B to R, then I'm also immediately annotating it uh, with this edge function here. But at this point, the function is not yet evaluated. Function evaluation in IDE, at least as it's described in the paper, it actually happens in the second phase when these functions are then evaluated. So then you would actually need to start with some initial, um, in this case, numerical value up here at the beginning of the program. And then this value would be pushed through these edge functions to see eventually which concrete values uh, you end up with. But what's now important is that um, this context dependent information, in this case, the numeric values, that is now transcribed in a context independent format, right? So if you now take a look at these uh, particular function annotations here, um, they always hold for this procedure that we are summarizing here, right? Uh, they never need to change if only i changes, right? So um, it's really independent of the context. And now um, in this larger context here, let's take a look at how this is useful, right? So let's take a look at the simple program where we initialize t with zero, and then this value is passed to the increment function, the result is passed to the increment function again, and then in the end we print the value, okay? So very similar to what we saw before. Um, in this case, the tautological fact, it's always mapped to itself, right? So that's uh, kind of boring. Um, and it always, by definition, has this identity edge annotation, okay? So um, that's rather simple. Um, then here, we would actually say that, okay, we are creating a value for T out of thin air, okay? That's similar to tainting T. Um, and here we need to track T because it is holding some constant value. And here we are assuming we are doing a constant propagation, right? So we want to generate T, but we not only want to generate T, but we also want to generate the information that T has the value zero, right? So how do we do that now? Well, in IDE, you actually do this 
again using an edge function. Only in this case, it's actually a constant edge function. So we would literally annotate this red flow function with an edge function that looks like this. So it's basically a constant function that always returns zero, right? So it's saying no matter what uh, value i you give me as an input, I don't care about it. That value is being replaced by zero, right? So that, that's basically saying no matter what value t was holding earlier, I now definitely know that, it's zero, that it is zero. Then we have call flow functions again, which map um, this tautological fact to itself. Um, and that they also map t to this formal parameter v here, okay? And um, yeah, so for these kinds of call flow functions, I guess most of the time, they will actually be, uh, there will be um, identity edge functions annotated to them. Um, I currently can't think of any case where you would wanna do it differently. There might be some exceptions, but I guess they are rare. Um, and then um, here um, we are propagating V onto itself because V itself actually never changes. Um, so this is also still annotated with the identity function. Um, but then here we actually have this assignment from V to R and now most importantly, this is now where we see this increment function, right? So here, like I explained earlier, we want to update the value um, that V holds to obtain the value that R holds now. And now the question is, um, well, we have again reached the end of a procedure and um, in IFDS, we would summarize this procedure now using summary edges, right? And um, the question is now, how are summaries being created in IDE? Well, essentially, um, it's very similar to what we also saw in IFDS. So in IFDS, we had these path edges, right? So a path edge would summarize a path that starts at the beginning of the procedure and ends at the current statement. In um, IDE, we have a very similar construct, which is called jump function. So it's no longer a simple path edge because it's no longer a simple edge. Instead, it's really a function because it also now, it's still an edge, but it has a function annotation. That's why it's called a jump function. And uh, well, it's called a jump function because it jumps across different statements, right? I guess you could also have called it a path function that it doesn't really matter much, right? It's just terminology, but essentially it still summarizes a path only this time uh, using a function. So um, again, we start with a initial jump function that looks just like an initial path edge, but we still have to annotate it with some initial um, edge function, right? And in this case, we again choose the identity function because nothing has happened yet. And now we again want to extend this partial summary, right? So we have a summary that ends here and we have flow functions that bring us here and there. So we want to extend this jump function to other jump functions that lead us to these two nodes, right? And um, in particular then, yeah, they immediately bring us to the next statement, right? So we can actually prolong them directly to here. And so let's say we want to compute a jump function that brings us to this node here. Um, then how would we do this? Well, we have the initial, uh, the initial jump function that we have here. And then we want to compose that with the effect that we have here, right? And what is the effect of this data flow? Well, it's the constant function zero, right? So we would take um, the identity function and then we would compose that with the constant function. Be reminded that you have to read these function compositions from right to the left, right? So th this is what, what we start with, and then we compose it with this function. Um, and that's, if you reduce it, um, if you reduce that expression, it again gives you the constant function zero, right? So we would label this edge also with the constant function zero. Now we have a new jump function that brings us here. And um, then we have a call edge here, right? That is also labeled. Um, and then uh, we basically need to follow that as well, right? So um, here we again do the same trick that we also did um, at, in IFDS. Be reminded in IFDS, 
We also had the situation that we would not create a path edge from here to there, but instead in order to be able to really uh, receive a context independent summary, um, we rather start new path edges here at the side of the core lead, right? So um, because we now have a data flow that reaches V here, we are now starting the analysis of V in the call E procedure, again, using such an initial summary edge or um, jump function. So that's, again, making this context independent, right? So in particular, there's no dependency on this concrete function here. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because we don't want a summary that says, uh, well, I know what this call E procedure does if the input is zero, we don't want that, right? We want a summary that says, I know what the callee does irrespective of that particular input value, right? Um, yeah, and then we would basically want to create again uh, a jump function that brings us all the way down here, right? So um, we would, in this case, start with this initial jump function and then we would have another identity function here and another identity function there. So you essentially get such a function composition. And that means that this yellowish edge, it would also be labeled with identity yet again. On the right hand side, things are a bit more interesting because here we don't have just identity. We also have the increment function, but essentially it's the same, right? So we would start with the identity function, we compose it with the increment function, have another identity function down there. And again, if you simplify this, then you also uh, get this particular increment function here. Okay. And now we have jump functions uh, to exit points, right, of the procedure. So we have jump functions that span the entire Corley procedure. And these then essentially again become summary functions, right? So after we have analyzed the call E, we would get a summary that looks like this. And that's exactly what we want, right? So now we have uh, a summary representation that is intentional. So it uh, abstracts away from all the concrete numerical values, but it nonetheless captures exactly the effects of the call E um, and the effects that this call E has on these numeric values. And now we can apply this to the calling context, right? That's also what we would do in IFDS. So um, here now we could also compute such a jump function that leads us there. Um, and we had already computed uh, this jump function down here. Um, then we could compute this further, right? So this also reaches down here, but that's not so important. What is now important um, that this reaches here um, and this can now be uh, map back to here using the uh, return flow function, right? So um, this is basically saying, um, first of all, I know that the call leads me from here to there. To the summary, I know that this maps to this node here. And to the return flow function, I also know that this maps down here, right? And so what I have to do now in order to compute um, this jump function here, so I have to compose all of these three different functions. So I have to compose the core flow function with the um, summary function and the return flow function. But then actually I also need to add in the call to return flow. And because this is coming um, from another control flow, I'm actually merging together this data flow and uh, this data flow here using the meet operator. In this case, this is going to be entirely boring because it looks like this. So basically coming from here and then to this uh, flow function here, we get this part of the function, okay? And then using this path here, so the summary that brings us here and then these data flows, we get this part. And then this is being merged together using the meet operator, okay? But because it's all identity here, well, it's really boring. You can't really see anything interesting going on, right? So quite trivially, 
um, also this sort of cyan edge here um, that is also being labeled with identity. So this is just for you to read up at home, right? So you have the jump function to before the call. Um, and then we have these two different paths by passing the call and through the call. Um, and then we have our call flow function, the summary function, the return flow function. And here we also have the call to return flow function on the right hand side. So now let's look at the second case, which is a bit more interesting, right? So the, we want to create now the jump function that brings us from here to there. And now the question is, what edge function do we need to label this jump function with, right? Or this path edge with. Um, and now it's essentially the same thing, right? So we here already had a jump function that brought us here, and that is already labeled. Um, so really inductively with this constant function zero, okay? And then we have an identity function here, we have an increment function there, and then we have another um, return flow function here. So that's exactly the function composition that you see here. Um, and in this case, let's just assume there is no call to return flow that's relevant here, right? Okay. Um, and now the somewhat interesting question is how do you compose these functions together? And um, now if you implement an IDE-based program analysis, then these composition operators are actually something that you need to implement in your abstract domain. So here you can see that if we have a constant function zero and we compose it with an increment function, then what does it become? Well, the constant function one, right? So uh, we have composition operators that allow us to reduce this somewhat complex expression to again, such a simple expression. And um, so you can show that if you have a distributed problem, then in general, it's possible to find such uh, composition or reduction operators, um, but you still need to implement them, of course, in a sensible way. All right. And now this is the edge function that goes along uh, this path edge, right? So that makes, that turns this path edge into a jump function. And now this continues, right? So here um, at this point, uh, again, we have a trivial data flow, so this is being extended. Um, and uh, now we have a second call to the same procedure, right? But now it's a different call with a different context because um, initially up here, well, we also had an edge to X, but it was labeled with the constant function zero, and now it's labeled with one, right? But what's interesting now is um, it's still the very same process, right? So we don't have to change anything at all with respect to these summaries. The summary still holds because the summary, it's, well, it really only matches on V, right? It, it doesn't match on the numerical value. So it's a summary with, with respect to this formal parameter V and it's still this parameter that this numeric value is flowing to. So the summary can be entirely reused. Only now when we again apply the summary in this new calling context, that's now where the numeric value comes into play, right? Because now when we create this new green jump function here, then we again look at the current jump function that we have here already, right? So we would now take the initial jump function that uh, represents the constant value one, and we would again go through this function composition here. So that part is the same we had before, but because we now have the initial constant function one and not zero, we now obtain as a result, the constant function two and not one, right? So this new jump function, it's now labeled with the constant function two. And this can then be propagated down here um, so that we get a jump function um, that is labeled the very same way that brings us to this print statement. And that you could now consider our final result, right? So using this function, uh, this red jump function, we have now learned that at the print statement, the value y actually has the numeric value two. And uh, yeah, I hope you understood now that um, 
really the um, context sensitivity. So the, the way in which context values are taken into account here, it only comes to this function composition that you do at the side of the caller. So you really do it individually at every single call site that uh, matters, right? Um, but the callee site summary, it never really changes. And that's exactly what makes IDE so powerful. Now, um, there's a bit more to be said maybe about what happens at merge points. And I'll be talking about this after a short break. <laughs> 